Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. Welcome, John Hammersley. It's a huge pleasure meeting you. We've met earlier this year in London when I visited your offices. And yeah, welcome to the show and excited to hear. It's, it's great to be here. Thanks for welcome inviting me. So, so those of our listeners, you might know John as the founder of Overleaf and now still working, so to say, or in another capacity within digital science. Um, so yeah, let's let's just go back in time a little bit. So the story of Overleaf has been written about a few times. You've given plenty of interviews, but now I don't know. Let's let's have another. <laughs> Another one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's like from the perspective of also like reproducibility and what like the, the changes brought to academia and, and yeah, in, in terms of, yeah, let's maybe just yeah. start. Yeah, what academia what is maybe a good place. Like? It's a good place to start really, actually. So mm. um, I'm a mathematician. I did, I did a PhD at Durham University in the UK. And, and my PhD was very theoretical and computational. Um, it was in holography and the ADS-C of T cor correspondence, if anyone's interested. Um, and whilst I enjoyed it, I remember I struggled to see how I could maybe contribute meaningfully to the field. I think towards the end of it, I was just, I was definitely struggling a bit. And I do remember being overwhelmed by the volume of papers appearing on the archive every day. And I think that, I mean, there's even more now. I mean, this was a, mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, but so towards the end of my PhD, I started looking for jobs in industry. Ones where maybe I sort of maybe just more a bit more connected with day to day stuff and where I felt I could make more of an impact. And, and I ended up joining a small company based in Bristol in the UK who were building the world's first driverless taxi system. So Which I kind of went running. from IT. Which is still running, yeah. It was amazing to be part of the team. And there's the system of 21 vehicles is still operating at Heathrow Airport today. So if you search for Heathrow Pod, you can find a bit of a bit about it. Um, but perhaps more importantly, and 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 you know, luckily, like I was, I was lucky enough to have a fantastic mentor there. So Professor Martin Lawson, um, who is the person who interviewed me, and 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 sort of who was my sort of immediate boss in. Uh, media manager in the company he was the founder of that that company um he was focused on the research side but he was an engineer he'd done all sorts of amazing things and he encouraged us in the research team to continue to write up and publish our work and and this is really where we ran into the problem that would be the catalyst for for building overleaf um so essentially john my co-founder who's also called john john mm -hmm. Miller, and i we were both mathematicians so we were used to writing papers in latex as that's the default in our field but if, but we were now collaborating with people who who never used it before. And if you've never used LaTeX before, you're probably thinking, "What is that word? What is that?" Mm -hmm. um, and the challenge we had was that collaborating with people who never used it before, there was no easy way for them to get started. And effectively, John built one called Write LaTeX. Um, mm -hmm. It allowed us to collaborate on LaTeX documents directly in a web browser with nothing to install. And so suddenly, there was no barrier to getting started like there was before. Um, and so John built this for, for us to use in our research group, but because it was web-based, it was available on the internet and other people could find it and start using it. And, and they did. And, and so we built this, you know, in building this to solve a problem we ourselves were facing, it turned out we'd solved a problem a lot of other, for a lot of other people too. Mm. And because right late, use of right latex started to grow, you know, we decided to quit our jobs to work on it full time, you know, and I guess then, you know, if fast forward to today, 10 years later, we've got 12 million users. And, you know, suddenly this thing, which started out almost as a side project, um, you know, grew into, but it really came from solving a problem we had ourselves, like collaborating mm. on LaTeX documents. And LaTeX, LaTeX is a brilliant system for writing papers and writing anything you want to look professional, but it did have a, a sort of steep learning curve, a barrier to entry. And, you know, we were, as we came along, at the time, 
10 years ago, other services were moving to the browser. And so it was a good timing to, to be working on this. It, you know, the technologies that were around enabled us to do it. Um, so it was a bit of, you know, we solved a problem for ourselves. We, we were kind of in there at the right time. Also, we were both personally in situations where we could quit our jobs and to work on it full time. We didn't have kids at the time, <laughs> you know, so we, it, there was a lot of things that kind of aligned um, to, to do that. But we were lucky in that we started out, if you like, with a product that people were already using. And so we kind of, we knew we had something there and that was why we, we decided to yeah. go for it. Could you maybe briefly just explain what the steep learning curve was and the barrier for people not to use LaTeX is a bit like technical sure. and a little bit. Sure. So LaTeX, if you've, if you've never heard of it or never used it before, you might be familiar with HTML, which is mm -hmm. how you write web pages and how you, how you, how you get to you know, take content and, um, that you'd want to write and get it published on the web. And so LaTeX was a similar sort of language that helps you take content that you might want to write and have it published in a format more like a, a research paper or you know a book. And it would take care of the typesetting for you. And it would take care of all of that. Mm. Um, that kind of formatting, which is really hard to do in, 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 in MS Word. Like if you've used Word for a big document, especially collaboratively, it's very easy for the formatting to break. And it's, it's very easy for it to not look very nice at the end. Whereas with LaTeX, like LaTeX documents look beautiful at the end. Um, but the challenge is because it's this, it's a sort of coding, it's a coding language. Mm. It has that barrier to entry, especially if you're not familiar with coding languages and you're not familiar with how to get started. And before write LaTeX, and, and there were other services as well at the time you know, that, that were doing this as well. Um, that started out at a similar time to us before before we moved it to the web browser you had to install quite a big you know file but a big sort of program on your computer to use it um, because it was a, a coding language you had to compile the document and you had to run a series of different commands to compile the document and then compile the bibliography file and then compile the document again and so there were just many ways in which you could run into problems before you'd even seen your kind of nice output mm. and what what we helped do is mean that actually right from the start you could see this look this beautiful output that you were getting and, and it it just meant that you kind of saw that okay yeah i can see the reason for persevering now a lot earlier um and so yeah the barriers were in, installing it was a pain it was difficult to write errors and it was also difficult to get help so if I install LaTeX on my computer and you install it on yours, you might run into a problem, but it might just be to do with your computer or you might have installed it differently to me and we couldn't necessarily see the same document. So mm -hmm. that was the other big advantage is if you knew someone who knew how to write in LaTeX, then it was much easier for them to help solve any problems you had. And so it was, again, it was much easier for people learning to get help and, and you know, just to to not get put off uh, mm. basically and we actually like a lot of the early like enthusiastic emails we got were from teachers who said i'm teaching a course like maybe introduction to proofs um in your know, maths course and previously they would have to spend two or three weeks at the start of the course getting all of the individual students set up with latex on the laptop or on their computer and now they could just say just go to overleaf um, and then, you know, in the first session, everyone's ready to go. And so it saved a lot of time for teachers who are, you know, who are teaching courses at universities where they they needed their students to use LaTeX. And so, again, it was just, it solved all these other related problems that, you know, were very similar to the ones that we had, but it just meant that the Overleaf have had this quite, quite broad um, sort of usability early on. And I guess I'm, I'm using right LaTeX as the name and Overleaf as the name we started out with. Is being called right latex mm. and, and you know since oh okay you know, yeah but latex is also the programming language to start with and then right latex is the first company name yeah and... exactly so latex has been around for for 50 years or so um mm -hmm. and right latex was the first company name yeah and and, and then we moved to overleaf why what what does overleaf name mean now it's one of our questions we had as we discussed uh yeah this one so, yeah it's and, probably not the first one to ask you but no but it is nice and it is you know it, you know it's 
so so basically yeah we were called right latex early on which made a lot of sense um because people were searching google for like how do i write in latex and so having right latex in the domain name that was great because it meant you know it helped with people finding us in the early days but then as we grew and as we sort of we kept making it easier for for people to use LaTeX who'd never heard of it before, you just run into problems of right LaTeX has many different spellings like LaTeX. I'm pronouncing it with a, a soft sort of k sound at mm -hmm. the end, um, but when you write it, it's L A T E X. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that the X is a chi, and 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 so hence the k sound. But if I said LaTeX to people. The, there are many ways of spelling it and write. You can have write, right hand, you know, write, write with a piece of paper. Um, yeah, in German, I think we say letech. Letech. Yeah, let's, let's oh. there's, there's, there's many. E and Greek. Uh, or... Yeah, so so I think we realized that because the usage was growing and like like mm -hmm. I say, it was attracting people to use this kind of software that that maybe hadn't heard of it before. We we felt we could still be the best online LaTeX editor with a different name. But we were going to struggle to continue to grow and broaden out if we stayed as right latex. So that that was kind of the motivation for looking for a new name, and that kicked off this. Okay, what new name can we can we go for? And and it, I think it took us about three months or something. We started out with other sort of descriptive names. So we had Paper Fox was one idea, Science Pad, Research Wave, like other things which almost <laughs> tried to in their name have a description. Yeah, uh -huh. Research Wave. Um, <laughs> It was not long after Google Wave launched and then fizzled out. And so we kind of went, well, we can't have Wave in the name now because oh, okay. um, like that's going to have a negative association. But mm -hmm. we struggled to find a descriptive name that felt quite right and quite memorable, like Science Pad. OK, people using, you know, there are a lot of scientists using Overleaf, but it's used in the humanities and in other areas as well. And then and so then we started to look at you know, the other way of naming something is just to pick a memorable word, you know, and, and not necessarily have it, you know, relate to the, you know, the product Apple, you know, is a great example, like, you know, like mm -hmm. that's, a, you know, it's not an Apple you're getting, but it's just a very memorable word, easy to spell, easy to say, you know, it's, it's, when you say it, it's very hard to get it confused with something else. So we decided to try and think of names along those lines. And then one afternoon, I think I wrote down Overleaf. And because it it also has that connection with print, like you know, see over leaf, turn you know, you know, over the page. Mm -hmm. It felt like actually that was quite it was quite nice, and the domain was available to buy. It wasn't free, but like we, it wasn't too expensive, so we could use some of our sort of early investment money to get the dot com domain. And so, you know, we decided to to go for it, you know, and um, hence Overleaf was born. Um, and I think it's it's. I think it's worked well, actually. Yeah, I think we've managed to build up a, um, a nice identity around it. We ran a competition to design the logo um, early on. So we had lots of people, you know, we had lots of different ideas behind the logo, um, which we which we picked on. And uh, um, yeah, but it, it really came out of that wanting to have a broader name that was um, easier to remember, easier to say, and, and just to sort of get away from some of the confusion that, that could come from. Mm. Right, LaTeX as a as a name. It is a nice logo and a nice name. It's, it sounds, sounds, yeah, it sounds, sounds like. Yeah, but it, I, I, I mean, it's a bit. There's always a bit of luck with these things. I think, I think it worked out well. But yeah, I mean, we had so many, so many that we went through. Um, yeah, like Paper Fox is one. Like, but like I say, Paper Fox Research Wave. They stick, they stick yeah. in, the, in the mind. Yeah, and, like Paper Fox sounds like Firefox. Well, yeah, you know, and and there was other, like I say, I think we, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but okay. Mm -hmm. So now with the name, um, so how how long into the journey, the entrepreneurial journey, came the name change? Was it like a year? I think it was in early twenty fourteen. Um, we did it. Yeah, I think it was quite early on. Um, because, I mean, one thing like it's easier to do early on before you started mm -hmm. building up the. The sort of you know being being well known or something um so i think we thought if we were going to do it we want to do it and we also want to want us to do it once i remember we decided to make the change at christmas time because that was our lowest usage is mm -hmm. is over the christmas week right. i think it's just it drops right off 
which is great. Researchers, students are at home with their families, not writing. And now some of us take times off during yeah. holidays. <laughs> but it meant that it was actually quite hard. A, it meant that we were working over Christmas that yeah. year. Um, but it did mean that like it was it was quite hard for a long time just to figure out like if it had, had any like the effect it had had on on usage and growth because every year like like you have these ups and downs and so we had the down going into Christmas and then we had to came, come up again and it wasn't until many years later you could try and work out like did it impact on like um, mm -hmm. growth and we think it did it did like growth like in the immediate year afterwards was a bit lower as it took a bit of time for overleaf.com the domain to sort of build up some of the reputation we tried to do everything according to you know uh like the experts on how you how you do the redirects how you do everything but but even so it was a bit of a risk to to mm. change names and change domains but um yeah we wanted to do it early just because it was that you know yeah the yeah. earlier you do it the better and... of course so okay and now what, what did you did you like was there an immediate change of perception with the name change of course there was some like coverage or or what is it awareness and and user what did the users say the early adopters Were they yeah i think i think we had a lot of positive um reaction to it i think you know we'd We'd also recently developed at the time the sort of very first version of the visual editor that you now have in Overleaf. So in Overleaf, there's two modes of writing. You can write in the source and the code editor where you edit the latex source directly, but you can also edit in a visual editor um, where you some of the code is hidden away. And again, it's just a bit friendlier if you're new Wait, to- But that's actually a game changer for those who are not so tech fiend like myself. Yeah, exactly. And we had, we had a very early version of this. It, called Rich, it was called Rich Text for, uh -huh. for a long time. It's now the visual editor, which is a much better name. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we had this prototype. And so actually Overleaf had originally come about as being like, yeah, this way, you know, you could edit in LaTeX without needing to learn LaTeX or needing to learn so much LaTeX. And so we, there was there was an obvious rationale for the users. So I think users saw this as 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 a positive thing. You know, it saw that we were trying to make LaTeX more accessible to different people. And we've always had kind of someone did a nice triangle one time of how people use Overleaf. You can either edit in the code editor online, you can edit in the visual editor online, or because we have a Git bridge, like which lets you work locally on your own. ID, if you have a preferred editor that you like to work with locally, you could edit there and sync your changes. And so it meant that no matter how you preferred to work, you could work and collaborate and, and collaborate on Overleaf. And, and that's really, I think, you know, as we've grown over the years, we've, we've just kept trying to make it easier for researchers and students to do the things they need to do without the tool getting in the way, which it, it should help rather than kind of force people down one, mm. one particular route. As 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 the research journey, also the entrepreneurial journey, can be a little bit of a roller coaster. What what without going back into the pain points of of the, these experiences, but um, what what challenges did you see, and how did you obviously push through, and um, like what made you continue, or did you ever come to the point of like, well, are we really want to going to continue this with these kinds of targets, or was it never so hard? Yeah, it's, it's it's very intense in the early days of a startup. I think that's maybe a good word for it. We like we definitely threw ourselves into it. You know, we we tried to set ourselves some goals. Like when we quit our jobs, we said we want to go onto a startup accelerator in six months, ideally, you know, to give ourselves a sort of short term focus. And I think you do have to have kind of a what are we doing next? Mm -hmm. Like what are the things that we need to do? Um, but now that I'm a parent, like with of of little kids i now realize like looking back just how much there are a lot of similarities mm -hmm. between raising a kid and, and like it's just so much effort lots of sleepless nights you're just putting all this work in mm. to help grow and nurture a, a child and i think in many ways being a startup founder is quite similar like if you have to really care about it a lot it has to kind of you have to really you know believe in it you have to really want you know want it to help it succeed and, and you put in all the hours and it's long hours but kind of much like most parents will say, like, it's loads of sleep, it's nice. But when the kid does this thing and it, and it brings a smile to your face, like that makes it all worth it. And I think with Overleaf, you know, there's a lot, there was lots of sleepless nights, lots of hard work. But then you would, 
you know get some user milestones or you get you know you, you'd hit some some exciting thing and, and that would kind of make it all worthwhile and i think um you know we were in a bit of an unusual position with overleaf in that we had users kind of when we so when the reason we quit our jobs and went for it was that we got people using it already and we realized you know we joined bethnal green ventures startup accelerator and we were with you know a cohort of 10 teams and a lot of the other teams were building something they had had an idea, but they hadn't yet got that mm -hmm. fit with it. They hadn't yet kind of necessarily sort of got mm -hmm. the MVP out there, whereas we already had the MVP. And so like it's working. And so Wait, a lot of MVP the, as a minimal viable product. So minimal viable function, product, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah minimal so viable product. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so yeah, a lot of what we were trying trying to do is how do we keep building and scaling and developing Overleaf to, you know, keep meeting the needs of of researchers and how can we do this sustainably you know because there are costs associated with it how how can we grow that business and I think one of the I think just one of the key things for us early on is that you know we were we built this because we wanted to it was built it was built solve a problem we had in collaborating and and we we very much wanted to keep it a service that we would want to use you know so quite early on we decided like we're not going to go down the you know third party ads supported route which some startups go down like because because I know I I dislike having ads for things like in products so we kind of like you know some websites are supported by ads we kind of decided we weren't going to do that and then early on like we've all like we've all used a service where it's great and then something goes wrong you contact support and either you don't get hold of anyone or you get an automated reply or you get hold of someone that sounds like they've never used their product before so we were quite keen early on that we weren't going to do support like that we were going to have an in-house team it was me and john early mm -hmm. on and then tim and you know and then and people that joined we all did support for end users and then you know we were lucky we hired leanne c who's amazing um who who knows and we, we've always had an in-house support team and that's always been a big part of overleaf and i think you know i'm i think it was that caring about the product and wanting wanting it to be something that you used like personally that I think helps steer a lot of the decisions. And I'm really proud like that Overleaf is one of the things that's known for is the, is the support it provides to the end users. Um, yeah. but, we, were also, we were really lucky with hires. I think I should also say like Tim, who, who he was amazing. You know, again, he was the first person to join us. We were lucky, you know, to hire Tim and then Leanne C and Marianne. Like we, we were very lucky with the early hires. And I think that helped also set the 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 sort of culture and the tone and the and the sort of how we worked and everything and I think as we've grown like that's you know I think we've managed to keep hiring really great people you know mm. along and and I think that's why Overleaf is you know has continued to be successful really is we've we've managed to hire good people you know like I I mean I did some coding I'm not I'm not a computer scientist really like thankfully very early on all of my code got replaced by people who know how to write <laughs> proper code and things and mm. and so you know, and yeah, I think I'm really proud of the people that we hired and the team that we put together. And I think that's that's reflected in in then how how it's perceived in the community. Yeah, it sounds like the whole corporate culture is very human centric, both for the employees and the staff and the team as a whole, and towards the end users, having their needs, their support in mind, or at center actually of of what you do and how the product product is supposed to function and the product support, as you said, which is... Yeah, I think pe people yeah. have always... It, I mean, yeah, I think for me personally, like, I think I always focus on on, on people with it. You know, I, I, for me, it's like the research community, like, it's the researchers and the students that use Overleaf, like, that. that's mm. you know, that's why we're doing it, you know, because, like, they're the heart of the community. And, and um, yeah, so it's always been about the people for me, I think. Yeah, I wonder like how some other services don't oh well also create great products, but maybe less of with the I don't know with the people factor so much in the center. I don't know. And then maybe it's it's harder and, and users get experiences that are rather frustrating because for the reasons you mentioned. But yeah, but I think yeah, it's just a good reminder that it's like anything we develop as a product for society is actually to serve us humans, as people, and not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. and I think, I, I mean, like, we were lucky because we had users early on. So, like, if you like, we were 
it forced us to keep that focus on what the users wanted and what they were doing. And I, yeah, I'm sure it played into like we we probably had a bit of a natural tendency to do that anyway. But you know, I'm sure like the fact that we had users early on meant that we could get user feedback. You know, we you know we weren't developing this mm. in isolation, and we weren't having sort of recruit users to test it. Mm. But we just we had people using it and. It meant that early on, you know, right from early on, you could get feedback and help get sort of steer on what was important. And... Mm. I'd like to maybe spend a few minutes on the cool features that Overleaf provides besides the collaboration aspect, but also mm -hmm. um, the publishing journey for researchers is often to go from one journal to another. And I, I train researchers in scientific writing and then also often recommend overleaf as a tool to do that especially for remotely working teams or people of different locations um or when you happen to be in the home office for whatever reason um so but then like yeah and then like from your experience and how overleaf is designed because what some 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 people say is that, oh, you should go to some journals or wherever you want to publish your work and look up their editorial guidelines or mm -hmm. writing guidelines, is it, is it the writer's guide, and how they want to have the manuscript formatted, which is what Overleaf helps you with, or any yep. feature, but Overleaf makes it easy and, and seamless for you. Um, and then if you end up with a rejection, you can just reform it like with a few mouse clicks, well, I'm exaggerating probably, but right? more easily as if we would have to do it with other systems that are more traditional. Um, and then resubmit with another journal. So from from your user experience and, and what you, like how you develop the product, is that one of the benefits? Like to, to keep formatting easy from the start as you write, yep. but also to make it easy to comply with editorial boards, formatting policies? and then making yeah. adjustments as you move. Yeah, so I should say we work we work with quite a lot of other partners in the publishing space mm -hmm. like over the years, like both publishers and journals themselves and other services that sort of work with them. And yeah, I think overly helps because previously like the author guidelines you know, were separate from where you were writing, you know, like, so if you, if you wanted the author guidelines, often it was on a web page somewhere, um, and you were writing somewhere else. And, and by using templates on Overleaf, and we worked with a lot of journals to update their LaTeX templates or help, help create new ones if they, if they didn't have them, it meant that you could help put the instructions to authors right where they were writing. And then also LaTeX itself helps, um, it helps because it, it automatically does some of the formatting for you. It automatically means that you don't have to choose the font size. It's set up, mm. it's set already. You don't have to select some of the things. Like it's already done from the template and you can just focus on giving the author some of the other guidelines they might need to, which is just what sections should you have in it, like how long, you know, if there's any sort of restrictions on length, you can have those right where the author is writing. And, and yeah, and we found, and we found this wasn't a benefit just for sort of research papers, but like, you know, university thesis, dissertations and theses, sorry, mm. theses, whatever the right yeah. plural of theses is. Um, <laughs> you know, similarly, they had a lot of a template for that, but but it often struggled because people would, inst if you tried to use the template locally, it might not work on your computer. Mm. And they there was often difficulty in troubleshooting these problems. So it meant that it was harder for people to say, yeah, use LaTeX for this, even though LaTeX was great because there was that barrier and it ties in with sort of the barriers before. So, so yeah, like bringing LaTeX into the cloud and, and onto a web browser suddenly meant that, you know, universities could encourage the use of LaTeX. And we did a really good case study with Purdue, Uni Purdue University early on, which just showed like the number of meetings and the number of back and forth, like submissions that a student had to do when submitting a thesis was kind of halved or something like that if they wrote it in LaTeX versus if they'd written it in Word. And mm -hmm. so like they kind of got that, you know, tangible benefit of if you think how much it costs to have a meeting, like, you know, over the course of a year, they save like 500 or more meetings and, and you know, like a real benefit. And similarly for submitting to a journal, again, quite often if you submit to a journal, there might be some issue, there might be some problem but it might be that the journal sees one issue 
and you're working on your own LaTeX machine and you don't see that issue. And that meant that it was very hard for an author to go, I, I don't know how to solve this problem because I don't see this problem and, mm. and you're seeing this issue. And with Oblief, it meant the journals, the editors and the authors could see the same thing and, and either fix the problem if they had it or or realize that it wasn't a problem actually and, and carry on. So yeah, we it saves a lot of time. It, it is slightly more complicated than a couple of clicks to reformat between templates, but it is definitely a lot easier mm. than doing it in, in something like Word. You know, you just... It, we'd like to make it easier. I mean, I think we like improving templates and making some of this stuff easier. We've, I think we've made steps along the way. And, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like using, I think it's that having that same view of the, of the document, which really helped. And, you know, we, we worked with some journals on submission workflows over the years. So you had a one click submit from Overleaf into the journal. Um, and, and that worked. And we, we did it for repositories as well. So, you know, one of our, you know, early integrations was with Figshare to make it easier if you'd rent something that you wanted to submit there. And um, yeah, there's still, I, I think there's still a huge opportunity to make the the researcher workflow easier. Um, but equally the problems keep, or the opportunities or problems keep keep changing as well as like, you know, the world develops around us and new technologies emerge. And so I think Oblief's always tried to be as flexible as possible to fit into the workflow. Mm. Again, rather than creating something custom that maybe works now, but then in in a few years' time is, you know, other things have moved on and you're stuck supporting a custom thing. We try to, you know, just focus on the core editor and make make things as easy as possible from that perspective. Mm. Another question is the discoverability of the research output once it's in the indexing databases. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have features that? make that easier is there more of the well depends well once once the author then converts the data into pdf and then i think pdfs are to a certain degree machine readable or what can you say mm -hmm. about the interoperability with the discovery systems out there for yeah uh, so i would say i'm definitely not an expert on this but um okay. certainly latex helps because you know when you write something if you've used a use the template it will be tagged appropriately so if you write keywords in for example they will be mm -hmm. labeled as a keyword and identifiable mm -hmm. as a keyword and so all the different and similarly the author and the affiliations and so there, there's a huge potential to use the you know the latex source to provide you know very structured i mean it is very structured like mm -hmm. and you can use that structure further down the line and i think again i think there's been lots of ways to try and improve dissemination and improve sort of accessibility in, mm -hmm. in many ways and, it, and kind of in you know in in all the interpretations of accessibility you know both just more open and more available to people in different regions and also just generally more readable and generally more you know um and so later i think latex can help because it's a good structured format you know whereas in word you can easily just use bold to indicate something and what does that really mean so mm. with later you have the structure there um i think the the interesting thing has been and i think this is why research communication is just fascinating in general is like different there are different priorities and different things that are interesting to different people depending on your perspective whether you're the researcher yourself you, researcher you kind of care about i need to get this paper published and you know for better or for worse generally in in a high impact journal um because that'll help you get funding to get to do more research and you you kind of want the the process to be as quick and as painless as possible really you know for you know research funders who have to demonstrate impact of the funding but like you need some of the other metadata to be able to show the impact and show you know you know how widely sort of used some of this stuff was um mm. and i think where I think where they've been successes is where they've been able to align, you know, incentives with the desired output sort of, so making data and making code more available and more accessible, you know, I think we've seen an uptick in the amount of data that's published and supplementary material that's published. And as, as that's kind of become required by, you know, by funding requirements. So, you know, if you're using this grant for your research, you know, there's a requirement then to not just publish a paper, but to make the things you produced available as well. And so I think that's where we've seen, 
you know, when there's been good alignment between like incentives and and the desire, you know, like the ability to to share mm -hmm. share stuff. Um, but, there, but there's no need to integrate data repository linkages. I mean, obviously you have the uh, integration with Figshare, which also serves as a data repository. Yeah, but so we have some other ways of bringing data in to Overleaf. So, mm -hmm. um, and and this is definitely one area, and different people use this in different ways. Like Simon Porter, who's one of my colleagues at Digital Science, he actually, he's created some really cool workflows where he has his data and he brings it into his Overleaf project um, to create the figures. And then if the data is updated, it's just one click and then the figures right. updated. Mm -hmm. So, and that's definitely that kind of idea of, you know, more living notebooks or yeah. where things yeah. aren't, you it's know, right. like there's definitely opportunities there. And I think, um, and I think ideally, yeah, that that's where I think there's a lot of opportunity in future to help create that link between the data and the yeah. and the paper. The challenge is always there is work to do this, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. once you've got a paper almost written, like it's how you know, like is there is there enough incentive to try and you know um, make this all available and make this like you know and then sort of do this. So I think. There's a lot of opportunities there and, and Overleaf being in the cloud and with the ability to link in from other places allows you to do some of this stuff, as do other services, other computational notebooks and things allow it. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's really interesting is as as we as things move on, especially with some of the recent developments with things like ChatGPT, like trust in and in, in science and research integrity is kind of becoming more and more key and and you know like you know like there's a lot of you know work being done to how do you how do you make sure that you know like how how can you sort of just be sure that this is real research or all of these things and I, and I think actually the more ways you can link back to the original research and that you can actually link stuff together like helps show that yes we did this this is what we did yeah and so I think as as we go like these this ability to sort of better tie in with who did what and where and everything and, and how was the research done and what is the where's the data where's the code like right. it's going to become more important um, yeah and then we talk about reproducibility replicability and yeah making reuse of the data possible and increasing transparency and all of that um okay so so many thoughts in my head for the moment. So one question I had, like, does Overleaf also support LaTeX as such? Also support other languages, but probably other Latin-based languages. Am I say, saying that right? Like, but I'm I'm talking about languages that are, like Arabic, for example. Yeah, yeah. So it does. It has great support for um, different um, different languages, different character sets, you know, different alphabets. You can set up your document to be able to write mm. in your preferred language. Um, you can set up multilingual documents. So if you have, if it's English, but with sections in different languages, even like Mandarin or, you know, with completely different alphabets, you can, nice. you can set up. And actually Lian C is great. Uh, like, cause she, she speaks multiple languages and mm. actually she's got a great example of like, you know, a document with like, with thank you written in 30 different languages just each you know and so yeah it has it does have great support for 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 multilingual documents um, and does it also work with the language code so you can also kind of tag that that's whichever language with the iso code kind of thing so that the i'm talking i'm asking because the repositories are not so some of them are gearing towards as our next chapter to facilitate multilingualism in academia to make the language part also machine readable so to say yeah, so I mean, I I don't know in my head exactly how how it is all tagged, but mm. certainly sounds like, like for, it would be. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there would be some sort of tag in there, and I'm sure it would be identifiable. Mm. Like, um, but yeah, I I confess I have not written a multilingual paper. <laughs> um, I would say in a long time, but I don't, I don't think I've ever had to write a multilingual paper myself. Well, um, great to know that it's, it's, yes. yeah, most probably or, or sure, like, almost. Yeah, sure. and we have lots of templates. So a lot, a lot of the templates and overleaf are community mm -hmm. created, and so there's lots of templates in 
in local languages, you know, for specific universities or specific courses. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of support for it. But no, it's a good question about, you know, for them when it goes into repositories. Yeah. So scholarly services like Overleaf, do you feel like they've, they're still a niche product, like being like in a way that they could be more uh, used more? And like, obviously, I think we all know that there needs to be a high adoption of various kinds of services too. But then, okay, I think the question goes towards how do you feel about the scholarly services uh, landscape that we have today and how it's evolving over the next three to five years? Yeah, the really the interesting thing with Overleaf is is people do use it for all sorts of things. Like mm -hmm. it's not, it's you know we tend to focus on research papers or dissertations, but um, you can do all sorts of things. So like one of the early projects that was created in Overleaf that wasn't me or John was a set of wedding invitations. Um, because you want wedding invitations to look professionally typeset, yeah. you know, and you can do that in, in Overleaf and, you know, people write books, mm. you know, in Overleaf. Um, and yeah, I think, and this is where I think things like the visual editor are, 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 are sort of great because mm. I think one of the real, the real potential for Overleaf is, is not that it is limited to being an academic tool, but that actually you make the power of typesetting accessible to people yeah. who otherwise would have no way of creating a professional looking, you know, document or, 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 you know, like wedding invitations is a great example, like a formal or a formal letter or something that you, you know, if you do it in word, it looks like it's been done in Word and mm -hmm. Word is very easy to use and, and is also very general. And with, you know, I think with the visual editor and, and with some of the improvements in just making it easier to use, like Overleaf like has the potential to be to be much broader in scope. Um, and I think just generally, like, I think there is a lot of overlap between tools that people use in research and academia yeah. that are also used in industry and more widely, you know, GitHub is a great example it's a code repository and it's one that is used by people in writing academic code like doing research projects and it's also used you know by companies all over the world and and so i think whilst there are some niche services actually like the best services are the ones that you can use for multiple things because no one wants to learn a specific niche tool unless they really have to right everyone would prefer you know to use broad tools and I think you know Dropbox is another great example right of of it's used for all sorts of things because it was the easiest way mm. to share files yeah. you know it, it it kind of revolutionized sharing photos you know in the first instance I think that was the first example for me someone shared some photos and they shared a Dropbox link and say oh wow what's okay like this is new um, <laughs> yeah, no, they you know, and I, I remember that feeling and I think as well, I think it's the general tools which are going to have a lot of impact as well on, um, but, on, okay, on but, students because sorry, just just what yeah, like, Ch no, Chat GPT no. right is a yeah. great example, and I think we already see, you know, I was at MathFest, uh, which is a conference you know for mathematicians, math math educators, um, in the US recently, just the other week, and we were chatting with people who use Overleaf, and there was someone who'd been using it for a week, and we asked her. Oh yeah, when you run into a problem, like how do you do you look at the help articles? How do you find the answer? And and um quite often she said, Oh, I just asked Chat GPT, like, what's the latex code for a table? Okay. <laughs> and it would give her the latex code and then she puts it in a document. And you know, that is a new, you know, now people are using that kind of tool, whereas previously you might have gone to like Stack Exchange or you, you know, you would have gone to something niche. You know, whereas now there's an interface for asking those kind of questions that's right. that's that's much broader. Um, so I, I guess I mean I, I'm I'm a glass half full person. I, I'm an optimist, and I kind of I think there is a lot of amazing stuff happening at the moment. And I think I just I, I look back to sort of where things were years ago. Like there's so much more openness around you know research and the data and and you know there's still lots of stuff to do and it's in in some ways it's created other challenges of now you know people have more access to the original research but don't necessarily have all the context there as to what it means and 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 so how do you how do you try and help audiences understand all of this stuff but like that feels like a good problem to have rather than years mm -hmm. ago when research was only accessible to a very 
sort of small number of almost gatekeepers. Like it's much more accessible to the public now. We just have to try and help, you know, help make sure that it it's understandable and, and useful as well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, how, how much of your time do you still spend with Overleaf? Or... How much time do I still spend with Overleaf? So I, I've handed over all of the operational sort of day-to-day -day stuff. So I don't get involved in the day-to-day -day running of the company anymore. Um, which is great, like Marianne, Lee and John doing a brilliant job. Um, but I still am quite involved in the um, user community um, because that's part of my role at, at Digital Science, you know, is I'm looking at how, you know, Digital Science can best serve the, the researcher community in a way and, and the end users of the different products. And I think, you know, with Overleaf, we managed, you know, through how we did it and through luck and timing all of that stuff but we managed to create a great community of, of people who you know appreciate and enjoy using the, the mm. product and i think there's just there's just a huge opportunity to do that at digital science like each of the products has a great relationship with the users um but so i'm kind of trying to do it more at the company level of just how how can we make sure we we're listening to researchers and we're kind of uh you know continuing to serve researchers because yeah like it you know, we talk about research being the driving force behind progress, like, oh, you know, research gave us this, you know, this new development. Mm -hmm. But like, I kind of want to go a step further back. It's the researchers who did the research <laughs> that, that gave us all of this stuff. Like, it's not just the research. Again, back to people, yeah. right? Like, and so oh. the more we can support researchers and students who are going to go on to become researchers, the more we can mm -hmm. make sure that we're sort of helping and, and sort of listening to their needs and trying to, you know, you know, be a, a sort of useful member of the community. I think that's mm. that's the exciting thing. Yeah, I think that's a it's a perfect closing statement, I would say. Back to the human centric ideology yeah. or policy. Rather. You're saying I've been waffling on too much now. Like that's... Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to get like add? No, I think you're right. I think um I think you know, that was probably a good way to end it. Like I hadn't, I hadn't really necessarily thought about it like that before. But yeah, I think mm. I've always been quite people centric, and so bringing it back to the researchers and the community. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. I, I think yeah. I, it's it's good to hear, <laughs> and, and I think um, it's a good reminder for all of us who work on sub services in the scholarly or elsewhere um, sector, and. Or maybe like because just, just one final train of thought, um, because you have experience in the industry sector and now working well again for company, but but um as a scholarly service, uh, so as an entity, uh, well wider company with different products, um, like the intersection because at the end of the day. Uh, so research aims or is supposed to aim and support or serve society, but that the the knowledge transfer happens outside academia. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much like oh, like and and then with all the difficulties we have we, we have with um, making data available or progress also I should say more positively. Um, and what are your thoughts around that? How? How can we improve, or how well are we already operating across sectors? Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting. I mean, you know, collaboration collaboration can already mean quite a lot of different things, right? You have collaboration between people in the same field, collaboration across fields, um, mm -hmm. and one of the interesting things I think is when you you do hear about like you know research that was done in one area that that then goes on to have an amazing application in a different area and and I think that's always going to take different types of people it's going to take you know a mixture of academics industry and you know just people who approach things in different ways and startups as well like I think there's mm -hmm. a huge opportunity and and this is why I think the more open things are like the more useful and and openness both in things that do work things that don't work like we're often not very good at saying well I tried this and it didn't work mm. and so then you get a hundred other people who have a similar idea they try and it didn't work and I think the more the more we can 
try and make things more open and more more accessible cross disciplinary as well because I think that that is one challenge is that a mm-hmm. lot of information there is quite a high barrier still to sort of picking up something from a, a neighboring discipline um yeah the more the more we can try and make some accessible cross disciplinary like I hope that helps kind of fuel progress and, I, and I, again I I kind of see benefits of academia benefits of industry you know I think in academia you know there is there is perhaps more of a well, I was going to say more of a freedom to sort of focus on different things I guess with, with industry maybe the better way to phrase it is like with industry you're often focused on a particular end goal of product or a particular like application of something like how does this apply in this particular situation whereas in academic research you don't necessarily have to be focused quite so much on the application um but yeah I, I just think I think it takes all sorts of people working in all sorts of different places um with all sorts of different life experiences as well mm. like to to help make research better and so the more we can connect that up you know you know both geographically make things more accessible you know that that's the other beautiful thing i think with overleaf is it you know and, and just anything that is browser-based mm. web-based is that it, it allows people to have these collaborations across continents yeah. in a way that would have been much harder previously so um yeah I guess I'm optimistic I think there's a part to play for for all of it and I think it is it is about aligning the incentives and Mm -hmm. about trying to sort of provide the motivations for people to work on good things and and do do good things and um, you know it's never going to be perfect but yeah I think like I say I'm I'm optimistic I think we're making progress in many ways and 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 it's all about communication and keeping in like yeah just staying open to new ideas and and challenging our yeah and and being kind as well I'm just going to throw that out there because I think one of the challenges we have often is especially with some social media right the tendency is to be nasty Mm -hmm. not any one person doesn't do it but like often there's a focus on the negative stuff and I think you know the more we can just remember that like yeah generally people are trying to do good things in research Mm -hmm. Sure. Be, be kind to people that maybe that's a nice closing statement it's just as try well and be yeah kind, try and be kind <laughs> to people because we're all people all be kind yeah so. thank you so much and yeah. um thank you joe for having me most welcome and yeah all the best for the next 10 years and oh, don't say on. 10 uh, sounds yeah <laughs> i'm focused on the next few months like, whatever happens to, in the meantime. yeah <laughs> <laughs> only good cool. things okay see you really thank you Thanks for joining us to listen to this episode. Do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at accesstoperspectives.org. Email us at info at accesstoperspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.